Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Minimization, a Flexible Randomization Method. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now this chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank International Drug Development Institute, IDDI, who developed the content for this presentation. The International Drug Development Institute, IDDI, is an expert center in biostatistical and integrated e-clinical services for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in several disease areas, including oncology and ophthalmology. IDDI optimizes the clinical development of drugs, biologics, and devices thanks to proven statistical expertise and operational excellence. Founded in 1991, IDDI has offices in Belgium, Boston, Massachusetts, Raleigh, North Carolina, and San Francisco, California. And now it's my pleasure to introduce your speakers for today's event. First speaker is Mark Boys, Chief Scientific Officer of IDDI. Mark holds a SED in Biostatistics from the Harvard School of Public Health from Boston, Massachusetts. He is the founder of the International Drug Development Institute and of Clue Points, two biostatistical services organizations based in the US and Europe. Our other speaker is Linda Danielson, and she is the Chief Operating Officer at IDDI since 2011. Linda obtained her MS degree in biostatistics in 1990 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has over 25 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry and in clinical trial environment. Before coming to IDDI, Linda was the Head of Biostatistics at UCB Pharma in Belgium. And now I'm going to pass over the controls to our first speaker, and that is Linda. Linda, when you are ready, you may begin. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, our talk is Minimization of Flexible Randomization Method. And Mark and I will be sharing this talk. So I will start with explaining the method of minimization. Then Mark will cover the advantages. I will talk about what needs to be considered for implementation, and Mark will talk about challenges that need to be considered. So the goal of minimization is to maintain a good balance between all treatment groups with respect to prognostic factors, and also to maintain unpredictability of the next treatment assignment. So how does it work? I'll start with an example. Suppose we have a trial with two treatments, A and B, and age and sex are important prognostic factors. A 60-year-old woman is ready to be randomized. Suppose we currently have 94 patients in treatment A, 23 between 55 and 65, 55 women, and 16 at center XYZ, and we have 96 in treatment B. Now, if the patient were to be randomized into treatment A, the imbalance in the first group would become two because we would have 24 in group A compared to 22 in group B. We would have 56 women in group A compared to 54 in group B, another difference of two. And at the center, it would be 17 compared to 20. So that'd be a difference of three. If it was in group B, we would have zero, zero, and five. So the goal of the minimization is to minimize the total imbalance on some scale. And there are different methods to do this. The first one is the range method, shown here. This method uses the absolute value of the imbalance. In this case, for treatment A, it's 2 plus 2 plus 3, which makes 7. And in group B, it's 0 plus 0 plus 5, which of course is 5. And so in this case, treatment B would be preferred. 
Another method is called the variance method, since it takes the sum of the square of the imbalance. Coming back to our example, we would have 4 in group A plus 4 plus 9 is 17, and 0 and 0 and 5 in group B. So in this case, group A would be preferred because we would have a total of 17 compared to 25. At IDDI, we usually do use the variance method since the minimization of the variance is a commonly used criterion in statistics. In addition, it is simple to implement. White and Friedman have shown that the preferred treatment arm can be found by simply adding the number of patients in each stratum and then allocating the treatment with the lowest sum. In our example, the sum for treatment A is 94 and that for treatment B is 96, so treatment A would be preferred. In general, if we were to use a deterministic minimization, then we proceed as follows. Let XA represent the sum in column A and XB in column B. If XA minus XB is greater than zero, we allocate B. If the difference is less than zero, we allocate A. And if the two treatments are tied, we would allocate A or B at random with a probability of 0 0.5. Of course, it is not good practice to use a deterministic method and a stochastic method is preferred. Essentially, one uses a bias coin to choose the treatment. Suppose we use a value of 0 0.8 for P. In this case, if XA minus XB is greater than zero, then B will be allocated with probability of 0 0.8 and A with probability of 0 0.2. B would be more likely to be chosen but there still is a 20% chance that the minimization will choose A. If XA minus XB is less than zero, then we would allocate A with probability 0 0.8 and B with probability 0 0.2. Again, in the case of a tie, each has equal chance to be chosen. So as you can see, the method behind minimization are very straightforward and using a stochastic minimization still leaves some room for chance in the allocation of the treatment. Now that I presented the methods, Mark will discuss some advantages of minimization. Thank you, Linda. So you already mentioned the, the two first advantages of minimization. The first one, which is the reason we use it, is that it reduces the chance of accidental bias by balancing prognostic factors. And by the way, this is particularly useful in small trials. If you run a very large trial of several hundreds or thousands of patients, things will tend to balance out just by chance alone, and you will not have to worry about imbalances. But in small-scale trials, for example, phase two trials, where the numbers of patients are limited, it is particularly advantageous to try to balance the treatment arms with respect to prognostic factors. And you also mentioned, Linda, that uh, minimization makes treatment allocations unpredictable. But there are some other advantages. First of all, the number of factors that can be used in the minimization algorithm can be large. Actually, it's better if, they are, if, if there is a large number of factors to account for. And the strata, uh, conversely, can be small. In other words, there can be some strata with very few patients. And a typical example of this is when you have a multi-center trial with a lot of small sites or a lot of small centers with few patients each. And this is very commonly the case in cancer trials or ophthalmology trials. And finally, perhaps the main advantage of minimization, to be honest, is that it's a flexible method that automatically adapts to almost every situation you can think of. So I'd like to show an example of a uh, trial with, where we used minimization a long time ago. This is probably one of the first trials we used minimization for. And it was a pretty challenging trial because we had eight treatment arms. This was a two by two by two factorial design. Uh, there were three antiemetic therapies uh, tested in patients receiving cytotoxic anti-cancer therapies. And the three treatments were tropicetron at two doses, five versus 10, dexamethasone versus none, and alizaprid versus none. So two by two by two, that made a total of eight treatment arms. And in these patients, it was well known that um, there are major prognostic factors for nausea and vomiting. Uh, the major prognostic factors that the sponsor wanted to control for were sex uh, or gender, type of cancer, the dose of cisplatinum, which is a highly emetic, emetogenic uh, chemotherapy, the response to chemotherapy, and the center. And so 
in fact, we used minimization and the trial ended up being almost perfectly balanced as, as could be predicted. And this can be seen in a paper published in 1994 in Journal of Clinical Oncology. This is table one from this paper where we show the balance um, in terms of sex, cancer, cancer type, uh, cisplatin dose and response. Um, and as you see, each of the column is one treatment arm. There are eight columns. And the numbers uh, across all of these, treat, uh, of these eight treatment arms are perfectly balanced. Of note, look at ovarian cancer, for example. There were not many patients with ovarian cancer. Whoops, not too fast. Uh, not too many patients with ovarian cancer. And in fact, even in this, in this relatively small stratum, the numbers uh, tended to be uh, as balanced as uh, was possible. And the, the next slide actually shows you other trials. The next four slides shows other, uh, other trials where, that used minimization and that were used for um, well-known drugs, uh, Herceptin or Trastuzumab in uh, breast cancer. This is the pivotal trial that was used for registration of Trastuzumab. And it's a trial that used minimization as shown on the next slide. Uh, here is the uh, statistical section that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine where they described the minimization procedure that was used in this trial. The next slide shows you a trial in ophthalmology. Uh, this is a trial that IDDI was responsible for. So we used minimization and this drug, pegaptinib or macrogen, was approved for the treatment of uh, neovascular age-related macular degeneration. For this uh, paper, you have to go to the supplementary material, but again, this trial used a dynamic procedure, which was minimization uh, using several factors to minimize the imbalance between treatment arms. Next slide. So the, the question I think you might have is, well, do we really achieve better balance with minimization than with other methods such as permuted blocks, which is still a very commonly used method for a treatment allocation? And in order to study this in a formal way, we, we actually use simulations. It's hard to show results analytically, because minimization is really a dynamic algorithm. So we use simulations to have an idea of the kind of balance we achieve with minimization compared with other methods. And what we did was to use um, a meta-analysis of trials that we had the data of. And these trials were in advanced ovarian cancer. And it's an interesting cancer type to look at because it's well known that several factors have a very strong impact on the prognosis, on the survival of these patients. And these factors are listed here. Uh, the uh, presence of residual disease after the, um, the cytoreductive surgery, performance status of the patients, the age of the patients, the histologic grade of the tumor, and the FIGO stage of the tumor. In fact, if you look at these five factors together and model them, you can actually uh, uh, derive a prognostic risk grouping of these patients. And these curves show the survival experience of these patients depending on their risk group. So it's obvious that the difference between the low risk group and the high risk group is, is quite large, it's quite impressive, and it's actually way beyond the effect of treatment. No matter what treatment you use for ovarian cancer, the effect of treatment is much, much less than the effect of these very strong prognostic factors. And so it's important to balance uh, things out at baseline so that the effect of treatment is actually better estimated if you can account for the known causes of uh, uh, heterogeneity in the patient population. Next. So what we did was to generate data uh, based on the data from this meta-analysis. So we randomly sampled 400 patients with replacement from the meta-analysis data set. We generated a center and we uh, generated that center from a skewed distribution to reproduce what we observe in practice, which is that we have many small centers. We generated an entry time, uh, randomly sampling from a uniform distribution, and we generated a survival effect, uh, uh, sorry, a treatment effect on survival, uh, which was a reduction uh, of 20% in the risk, in the hazard rate for survival. So the hazard ratio was 0.8. Next. And we then uh, proceeded with our simulations. We generated a large number of trials, and then we randomized the patients in these trials using either simple randomization or permuted blocks within strata. And we had a number of different uh, um, stratification uh, factors uh, in this uh, for the permuted blocks, either center only, or center and prognostic group, or center and one factor, center and three factors, and center and five factors. So we increased the number of prognostic factors that we took into account in the allocation of patients to treatments. 
And then we use minimization with the exact same stratification as we had done for permuted blocks within strata. And here are the results of these simulations. First, we look at the imbalances within the strata. So the strata are the cross classification of all the factors that are taken into account at baseline. And so we can do a simple randomization in red, or we can do permuted block allocation in green, or we can do minimization in blue. And what you see at the bottom is different uh, stratifications. As you, as you see here, we used either center alone or, or center plus the risk grouping that I showed, or the permuted block uh, for center and one factor, center and three factors, etc. So this is the X axis. So these are the various cases we looked at in terms of increasing number of prognostic factors taken into account in the allocation of treatments. And what we see here is that the imbalances within the strata are pretty much the same regardless of the method used. The method that works best for this is obviously permuted blocks within strata because that method is designed to minimize the imbalance within the blocks. And so not surprisingly, if you have a lot of prognostic factors, that method performs better. This is the smaller bar in green. In fact, that method performs better by definition because it's designed for that if you have large numbers of factors. Obviously, you have to have enough patients in the study for these um, strata to be large enough in order to see that uh, benefit. Next, if on the other hand, we look at the marginal imbalances, which are the imbalances within the factors, not within the strata. So imbalance for gender, imbalance for histology, imbalance for center, etc. Then we look at uh, the difference between the various methods and we see that obviously a method that accounts for these factors is better than simple randomization. So the red bar is the worst in terms of the marginal imbalance. The green bars are better, but obviously the blue bars are still better because minimization is designed to minimize these marginal imbalances. And as you can see here, the more factors you enter into your algorithm, and the lower the marginal imbalance. So in a sense, minimization is the exact opposite to permuted blocks within strata. You can and probably should minimize for as many factors as you can think of. Of course, you need to think of factors that have a prognostic impact, obviously, not just any factor. Uh, but that is a rule to remember. It's good to minimize for most factors. And then finally, if you look at imbalances overall, in other words, just comparing the two treatment arms overall, Again, minimization does a better job overall than either simple randomization or permuted blocks. So to conclude on these uh, simulations, the advantages of minimization, in fact, go beyond the advantage of randomization, which um, I like this quote here by Cochrane and Cox, where they say randomization is kind of an insurance policy you take against accidental biases. And if you think of minimization, it's an extension of that. Minimization is just almost like an insurance policy against imbalances that could happen. They, they may not happen, but they could happen. And in fact, by using minimization, you reduce the risk of an accidental imbalance. And that is good in general for your trials. And I'm going to turn back to Linda for some implementation details. So minimization needs to be developed as part of a complete randomization and trial supply management system. The minimization algorithm is developed and validated in the core system. Then, for a specific clinical trial, the clinical software developer will develop the system according to the specifications. Once the system has been developed, it is validated by a system validation specialist who tests the system according to approved test scripts. A biostatistician must also be involved in order to validate the minimization algorithm before the system is released. The software developer will then update according to the validation comments and the validation uh, specialist will write the validation report so that the system can be released. In order to confirm that the minimization is working correctly, it is good practice to have a biostatistician who performs monthly checks. She will check that the global, global randomization balance and the balance within every minimization factor is correct, and she will also check the exactness of the subject's treatment allocation. Both the FDA and the EMA have general guidance documents regarding computer system validation, 
and the EMA also has a specific reflection paper on the use of interactive response technologies, also known as IWRS, also known as RTSN. So this reflection paper mentions some important requirements. As you can see, we have to define the access permissions, blinded versus unblinded. We have to be able to do emergency unblinding, and this must be possible for the investigator to do very quickly without having to contact the sponsor. Of course, the sponsor is made aware that an unblinding has occurred, but the sponsor does not receive the actual treatment. There has to be disaster recovery system, backup systems, manual interventions must be possible and then documented and the system must be updated. It should be accessible 24 hours a day, readily accessible audit trail and real time data. Now we mentioned in our abstract, the idea of manual randomization. Of course, this should be avoided whenever possible but we know that sometimes the sponsor is really in a hurry to get a study going and requests that the first patient be randomized as soon as possible, and even if it has to be done manually. For example, right now, IDDI is working on a COVID-19 study, and we only had two weeks between knowing about the study and having the first patient entering the study. Given the, given the urgency and importance, we grieved to put a manual procedure into place. If a manual procedure is needed for any reason, there are specific procedures and forms which must be available. There should be a study-specific manual randomization process and a manual and a randomization form. Other forms will depend on the needs of the study. For example, if the study is double-blind, a code break form is probably necessary. Manual randomization is possible for studies using either a randomization list or for studies using minimization, but input from biostatisticians is crucial in both cases. If we consider a manual randomization, which is based on a randomization list, first we have the biostatistician who creates the dummy list based on, all of the, based on the protocol, considering the stratification factors and the required block size. The actual list should be then created by someone who will be unblinded in the study, for example, the clinical software developer. He will then import this list into the RTSM system. When the center is ready to randomize a patient, they will fill out the randomization form that was created as part of the procedure. The form will be sent to the help desk who can randomize the patient based on the randomization list. They will then send the result back to the center who can treat the patient. Once the RTSM system is ready, the information from the manually randomized patients needs to be uploaded. However, in the case of a manual minimization, the process is different since there is no randomization list up front. The center will again fill out the form in order to randomize the patient. There needs to be a statistical process in place in addition to the manual randomization process and it's critical that the method used for the manual minimization is controlled by a biostatistician. Because of this, the form will be sent to the biostatistician who will run a program in order to minimize the patient using the same method as that to be used by the RTSM system once it's live. Once the program has been run, the information can be provided to the center and they can treat the patient. As in the manual process, all information, including time and date of minimization, needs to be uploaded to the system before the system is released. Now, of course, all of this seems very cumbersome, and it is. In fact, ideally, no manual procedure is necessary, and the process is much simpler. As mentioned earlier, the software developer, validation specialist, and biostatistician will prepare the system for use. Then, once the center is ready to randomize a patient, they can log into the system and immediately get the result in order to be able to treat the patient. Of course, there must be help desk staff available in case of any questions. As part of a validated RTSM system developed with statistical expertise and input, minimization can be a very straightforward procedure to implement and use. 
but we will pass this back to Mark and he will address some of the challenges of minimization. Thank you, Linda. Be before I go to the challenges, uh, could you remind us what RTSM means? I, I forget myself. Yes, it's <laughs> Randomization and Trial Supply Management. Oh, okay. I yes. forgot that acronym. Okay. All right, so back to the uh, sort of theory of minimization. Um, as, as probably most of you know, there have been, you know, it's challenges and pushback on minimization, uh, including from the agencies. So I think it's important to spend enough time on this topic and just to kind of um, make sure that everybody is on, uh, you know, is, is aligned on why minimization potentially can cause problems. I think that the first issue that the regulators may have had with minimization is that it is undoubtedly more complex than simple randomization. And in particular, they, they really stressed the need for a validated algorithm. I think Linda um, went over the kinds of, um, you know, procedures that you have to have in place to make sure that minimization actually works. And there have been a few cases, I, I, I'm told, of pro, uh, minimization programs that were incorrect and that, of course, the agencies then had to deal with. Um, and that, of course, is no good. So you, you need to be careful and, and have a well-validated system in place. Uh, mind you, this is, in my view, not more difficult than permuted blocks. If you think of the uh, mathematics behind minimization, it's actually trivial. It's, you know, the, the, the implementation details are so simple that any computer programmer who can program permuted blocks can program minimization just as well. Another challenge potentially with minimization is that some factors may not be reliably known at the time of randomization. This, of course, is not unique to minimization. If you use permuted blocks within Strata, uh, again, uh, the factors that are given at the time of randomization may turn out later to be incorrect. Uh, for example, a patient is um, uh, stratified in a low-risk group and later on, you know, after maybe central review of some data or after cleaning of the data, it turns out that the patient was not uh, truly in a, in a low risk group, but he was in a high risk group. And obviously the value provided at the time of randomization uh, now turns out to be incorrect. However, the patient is already randomized. And so whether you use permuted blocks within Strata or minimization, it's the same problem. You have to actually you know, account for the fact that the value provided at the time of randomization was incorrect. The policy to use here, again, whether you use permuted blocks within strata or minimization, is to keep the patient in the stratum that they were randomized to, no matter what, even if it's incorrect, because that is consistent with, um, you know, the, the principle that I will come to in a moment, which is listed here as analyze as you randomize. So a patient who's randomized in a certain stratum needs to be analyzed in that stratum, regardless of whether they truly belong in that stratum, uh, stratum or not. So that is, in fact, a, a problem that you have with all methods that account for prognostic factors at baseline. Next is, in fact, caution that is required for unequal randomization ratios. Uh, some papers have been written to show that you need to be careful if, if the allocation ratio is different from, you know, one to one, just equal numbers of patients on treatment A and treatment B. If you deviate from that simple ratio of one to one, for example, in um, phase two trials, we often randomize two to one, two to the experimental group for one in the control group, or even three to one in some cases. Well, in that, in that situation, you have to actually be careful that um, if you use minimization in a naive way, it's actually not correct. And indeed, some papers have been written and show convincingly that that would lead to biased allocation and that um, in the end, you would actually do worse than better by using minimization. The way we've implemented this at IDDI is if we have a two to one or a three to one randomization ratio, we simply consider that we have three groups or four groups, let's say two to one, we would have three groups and we would actually randomize one to one to one and then merge the two groups that correspond to uh, an identical treatment. Well, in that case, we don't run into any issues because it's the one to one to one equal randomization and the algorithm works perfectly well. If you have more odd ratios, for example, 
1.5 to 1 or maybe sometimes you could use you know 7 to 3 or some some strange ratio for the allocation i would not recommend doing this in general but some people you know use fancy allocation ratios there is a very good paper that we will show at the end in the references that covers that um, particular situation and provides a very elegant uh, way of implementing an algorithm that takes account of those situations and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the two last bullets on this slide. Some people claim that um, minimization may in inflate the type 1 error. Now, I have no idea why they say that, because theoretically, there is no reason why minimization should inflate the type 1 error. If anything, minimization should re reduce the type 1 error on average, because you know, if you reduce the chance of an imbalance, then you reduce the chance of accidental bias, and on average, you should reduce the type 1 error as well. So if anything, it's the opposite. You know, minimization should actually reduce type 1 rather than inflate type 1. And I will come to that uh, through stimulations. And finally, the lower power, some people uh, worry that if you use minimization, you might actually negatively affect the power of the trial. And again, the answer to this concern is no, it, minimization doesn't reduce the power, but I want to uh, provide some details as to why that is the case. So before we go to the power um, uh, uh, simulations, I would like to discuss the re-randomization test, which you have to use if you use minimization. And again, this is where you need to use a stochastic algorithm, because if the minimization is done stochastically, then each allocation has an element of randomness to it, even if there is an imbalance and you want minimization to correct for the imbalance, it will still be a random allocation. And so if you use a re-randomization test, what the test consists of is to actually run simulated trials identical to the trial that you actually performed. In other words, simulated trials which have the same data as your, tri as your trial, except that the treatment arms are reallocated. So each patient remains exactly as observed, and the only thing that changes is the label of the treatment to which this patient was allocated. In reality, the patient was allocated, let's say, to A or B, if you have two treatment arms, but the simulations consist of shuffling the A's and B's, in other words, reallocating patients at random to the two treatment arms being compared. And so because this reallocation is random, then you are under the null by definition. So you re-randomize the patients under the null and you actually derive the empirical distribution of the test statistic. So the top of this, um, you can oh, go sorry. back a little, Linda. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few more words on this, on the way the re-randomization test works. It's actually, um, it, it's a bit computer intensive, so you have to have software to do it, but it's conceptually quite a simple procedure. So as I said, you have your actual trial with the actual uh, patient data. Then you run the log rank test on the data as observed with the treatment allocation as done in, you know, in reality. That gives you one log rank p-value, which is the, in a sense, the asymptotic p-value of a log rank test for that particular treatment allocation. And then what you do is reallocate these patients in simulations using the same minimization algorithm as the algorithm you used initially. So what would you do is reshuffle the A and B uh, labels, but using the same minimization procedures as you did in the real trial. And that provides um, a distribution of the test statistic, the log rank test, under the null hypothesis. So it provides the distribution of the test statistic under the null, and that is the distribution you're going to use to calculate the empirical p-value. Next slide. And this is how it's done. So you do, let's say, 10,000 simulations or more, 100,000 simulations, if you like. So you simulate 100 trials, 100,000 trials, identical to the trial that was um, conducted in reality, with reshuffling of the treatment groups. And the distribution of the test statistic looks like a normal distribution, obviously. And what you have is an observed value for the test statistic, and you compare where this observed value falls compared with the empirical distribution under the null. And the red area is the area under the normal curve to the right of the observed value of the test statistics. That is the p-value based on the re-randomization test. So if you do this, actually, we've done a lot of these re-randomization tests. You can show that the re-randomization test p-value is almost always identical to the asymptotic p-value to the fourth or fifth decimal. 
if everything goes right, actually the p-value should be the same because it's based on asymptotic theory. It should be the same if you run a large enough number of simulations. And if it's not uh, very close to the asymptotic p-value, you have a problem. That means something went wrong and there is a bias in the treatment allocation that caused the problem. So in a sense, it's also a nice way of checking that the re-randomization, uh, that the, sorry, that the minimization worked well. So let me conclude with the power and size uh, situations. First, the type one error, so the size of the test. Again, um, there have been concerns that minimization might inflate type one. And using the same simulations as I showed before, again, the red shows simple randomization, the green bars show permuted block designs, and the blue bars correspond to minimization designs. And what you see here, looking at all these simulations, is that the type one error is actually well controlled whether you use simple randomization, whether you use permuted blocks within strata, and whether you use uh, minimization. If, and by the way, the unstratified test is shown um, in the solid bars, and the uh, stratified test stratified for the factors used in the minimization or the permuted blocks is shown in the dashed bar. But regardless of what results we look for, uh, we look at, it's obvious that the type one error is well controlled in all cases. In, if anything, type one error is a slightly smaller if you use an, adjust, um, an adjusted allocation based on prognostic factors at baseline. And this is visible both for permuted blocks and for minimization where your type one error tends to be, become smaller than the 5%, which is the threshold of, of interest here. That's the significance level we use. And finally, for the power, uh, the same simulations again, but now we compare, in fact, uh, the, 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 the log rank test, which is the solid bars, and the, um, and the re-randomization test, which is the dashed uh, bars. And so we use either a log rank test or a re-randomization test uh, for all these allocation methods. And what we see is that, yes, the power increases when you include more factors in the analysis. So if I analyze the data in an unstratified manner, the power is less than if I uh, stratify the test for one factor or three factors or five factors. And this is uh, to be expected because by stratifying the test for um, one, three or five factors, I in fact reduce the variance of the uh, treatment effect and therefore I have better power. So it's normal that this, this, these powers should go up if I stratify the test. But what's remarkable here is that the power of an, um, a, a log rank test is exactly the same, or at least very close to the power of the re-randomization test. And again, the power of the test depends on how many factors you stratify for, but not on how the patients were randomized. So the randomization method has zero impact on the power of the test. However, the stratification of the test does have a big impact. And so let me conclude. So we have still um, some time for questions. Um, the reason we like minimization is that it can be used effectively to achieve good balance for as many, fact as many prognostic factors as needed. And depending on the disease, sometimes there is only one factor of interest. Sometimes there's no factor that people know to affect the prognosis of the patients. But when there are, as in the ovarian cancer example, many factors that people really want to minimize for why not use minimization and let them balance the trial for these factors? Clinicians know what factors are important and it's very reassuring to them to see that the trial was well controlled and well balanced for these factors. So again, I think it's like an insurance policy against major imbalances that might rise, uh, raise questions. As I've shown through uh, simulations, minimization as well as permuted block designs actually ensure a, a very good control of type one error arguably stricter control than simple randomization because they, these methods tend to eliminate accidental bias. Uh, the treatment allocation method has no impact on power, as I just showed in the last slide. And as Linda uh, emphasized, uh, minimization should be implemented using a validated system as part of this RTSM, randomization and trial supply management. If you use minimization, you do need to use a re-randomization test. Yes, that is undoubtedly a complication compared with simply using 
uh, you know, the standard test that you would otherwise use. But as I showed, the re-randomization test really is a no-brainer. It just requires some computer power and it's really no big deal. And finally, contrary to some, what some people believe, minimization has been used very commonly in registration trials and therefore we believe that uh, there is no pushback particularly to be expected from the regulators if a new trial is run with minimization as the treatment allocation mechanism. Thank you very much and this concludes the talk. Um, Linda, I think we have quest uh, time for questions now. And here, by the way, here is the list of references I promised. The second reference by Han and colleagues is the one that is um, useful if you have a, 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 a treatment allocation in a ratio different from one to one. So if you have one of these odd um, allocation ratios, this is a very useful reference to, to read. The other references are the sort of historical references on minimization. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much, Linda, for that very insightful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And now we've come to the portion of the webinar where we are going to invite our audience members to send in their questions, and we'll let our speakers answer them. So, Linda and Mark, are you ready? Yeah. Sure. Okay, then, so let's begin. Here's our first question from our audience. When sites have a limited recruitment, for example, for rare diseases, is it useful to include site as minimization factor? I will take that. Um, it is useful to use site as a minimization factor because that way also, um, even thinking about drug supply and everything else, you know that you'll have a balanced um, treatment allocation within each site. And I think that's important. Now, of course, if it's a rare disease and there are a few patients, we probably would not use site in the analysis, but would use, would group the sites into something larger, such as country or region, depending. Yeah, which actually gets us back to this, um, you know, analyze as you randomize principle. If we use site as a minimization factor, some people would say, well, you didn't use site as a stratification factor in the analysis, so you kind of violate that principle. Uh, and this is true if you don't use a re-randomization test, but if you use a re-randomization test, because you use the same algorithm, for the re-randomization as you did initially. In fact, you did, in that case, you do analyze as you randomize. So the answer to that argument is to just say, well, we will use a re-randomization test and that will protect us uh, from uh, this criticism. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions right now coming in. Um, here's the next question. Is a minimum sample size needed to use minimization? Well, Do you I want to answer that, Mark? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I was <laughs> yes. going to say no, but <laughs> that's a short answer. I, maybe we could think of a longer one. Um, um, it, it seems to me that uh, one of the advantages of minimization, as I said, is that it's a flexible method. You don't have to worry about, you know, how many patients you have in the in the trial, how many prognostic factors you want to account for, how many sites you have, what is the size of these sites. In fact, minimization kind of self-adjusts to whatever the trial characteristics you have. So obviously, if you have a really, really small trial, like, yeah, I don't know, you know, 20 patients in a phase two trial, 10 versus 10, I think the overhead of putting a minimization in place is just completely unjustified in that case. But I think uh, for, you know, slightly bigger trials, maybe 40, 50 patients, sure, if there is a very strong prognostic factor that everybody worries about that could actually bias the results one way or the other, I think it's not a bad idea in that case to use minimization. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll go on to our next question. Uh, here it is. Is it recommended to use minimization for unequal randomization ratios, for example, two to one? And actually, Mark did address that in his presentation. And um, if it's a two to one, as he mentioned, it can be quite simple because you can just consider it one to one to one, and then everything works out fine. However, if it's something strange, uh, seven to 13, for example, then 
you can still use minimization, but you need to use different methods which are in the second reference that we have in our references. I mean, if someone asked me to do a trial with a 7 to 14 <laughs> minimization ratio, I think the next question would be, why not 1 to 2? Right. <laughs> you know, but yeah, sometimes you run into these strange situations. Okay. All right. Well, here's another question. If baseline imbalances in prognostic factors can be adjusted for in the analysis, what is the added value of using a more complex randomization method? Yeah, and again, I did address that too. Yeah. Um, Linda, I was going to say this is exactly the slide that I presented on the power um, of the trial, uh, which is a function of whether you do a stratified analysis or not and is completely independent of the type of method uh, of allocation method you choose. So indeed, if the purpose is to uh, optimize the power of the trial, then the treatment allocation becomes a non-issue. It doesn't matter what method you use. It has no impact on the power at all. Uh, However, the reason we still like to use minimization, as I said, is to avoid accidental imbalances. So it's more a question of avoiding a bias than increasing the power. And I actually also did want to mention that um, if you have already the system is developed, you know, using minimization or using a randomization list, in terms of the implementation of the system, it's just as easy to use minimization as the list. So setting up and running the study using minimization is just as easy. The complication comes later for the statistical analysis where we need to do a re-randomization test as well as maybe another test. But in terms of the setup, minimization is no more difficult to set up than um, randomization based on a list. Okay. Uh, here's a question. It looks like they're probably referencing one of your slides, um, so maybe you can help out in answering this. Uh, they say here, I assume it is rational to expect that the joint distributions will be balanced as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, sorry, I was away from my mic, um, but yeah, a good question. Um, if you minimize on the margins, in other words, in other words, if you use minimization, um, as I explained, you look at the margins, in other words, each factor separately, independent of the others, and then the question is, I guess, um, do you also minimize the cross-classification of these factors? And yes, you do. I mean, obviously, just on average, you will do better on the cross-classification as well if you minimize the margins. But it's not as good a balance as, as you would get uh, if you use permutable blocks within the strata. So it's a different way of, of, in fact, reducing the imbalance in the strata, but it's not as efficient if that's really the goal as would be permuted blocks. Now, the, the question is, what is most important? Is it to minimize the imbalance in the strata? which no one ever looks at, or is it better to minimize the balance, the imbalance in the margins, which is the table that everybody looks at? My view is that it's probably better to focus on the margins. And I did want to add one thing to that as well, is that in case of permuted block, if you have enough subjects and you're able to complete the blocks, then you have a very good balance within those um, stratum. But however, if you can't complete the blocks, for example, if you have lots of sites with very few patients, then you risk having an unbalance with permuted block as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You know, here's our next question. How does minimization compare to methods such as model-based optimal design? Um, yeah, I, th that's a good question. I, I think model-based optimal design ha uh, have a different uh, focus uh, than the one we covered today. The, 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 the methods we discussed today were methods aimed at ensuring, ensuring balance between the treatment arms. If you look at model-based optimal designs, these designs really aim at increasing the power or optimizing the power of the trial for the treatment effect of interest. And so the model actually tries to optimize the power rather than reduce the imbalance. It's a different objective, if you like. And I think in some cases, you really want to squeeze out the most power from the data as possible. In, the, in that case, you would use a, a model-based optimal design. Here, we worry more about the fact that 
you know, treatment groups might be imbalanced. And again, for, from a statistical point of view, from a pure statistical point of view, some would argue, well, that doesn't really matter because the analysis will account for these differences. If I do an analysis that accounts for the factors that might be imbalanced, the analysis will still provide an unbiased treatment estimate. And that's true. So in a sense, yes, you could say, strictly speaking, why bother about the balance? That's a view that some people hold. Personally, I think it's better to avoid imbalances because it makes everybody more comfortable. Uh, but some people would say, well, strictly speaking, from a statistical point of view, it is not required. And I, and I think we have to agree with that. It's true. It's true. From a pure statistical point of view, we could say, well, who cares? Let's just randomize, you know, completely at random. And we will use a method of analysis that accounts for any imbalances that I see. The problem there is, well, you have to pre-specify the analysis with stratification and all the rest of it. So in a sense, it's better to avoid the imbalance and then not worry about the exact model that you want to use in your, in your analysis than to have to pre-specify your method of analysis, not knowing where the imbalances might actually happen. Okay, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, let's see if we can go through some more here uh, with our audience and our speakers. And the next question is, how do I know the prognostic factors to adjust for while using minimization method? Well, I mean, that's a clinical question, right? When you design the trial, you have to ask the clinicians, you know, what is important in this disease? Is it, uh, you know, the age of the patient? Is it the stage of the disease? Is it, you know, another factor that might be more disease specific? So each disease has its own range of prognostic factors, and this requires a very in-depth discussion with clinicians, or at least looking at the literature and looking at previous trials in that disease and seeing what, you know, what pay, what what uh, people have worried about in the past. Uh, it's good to have prognostic factors that have a very strong impact on the outcome of interest because that's where you can gain power again, as I said, by stratifying the analysis for these factors. And so it, you have to know about the prognostic factors, whether it be for treatment allocation or for the for stratification of the analysis or both. And so I think this, this is an important aspect of the trial design. And I. As, as you mentioned, what's really important is the input for that has to come especially from the clinicians. You know, the statisticians can help by looking at the references that are out there in the literature, but the clinicians have to know the disease and know which factors are really important. Okay. All right, here's the next question here. Uh, could the multiplication of covariates included in the minimization dilute the balancing strength of the method with respect to the most important prognostic factors? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, boy, that's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I, I think our simulations, as I've shown, the results of our simulations t seem to indicate that if you adjust for more factors, you actually get better balance and uh, rather than worse balance for some, some of the most important factors. So my intuitive answer would be to say, based on our simulations, we think that having more factors is actually better. So I wouldn't worry about this myself, uh, but it, it's a really tough question. I mean, we haven't studied that particular question in detail. Again, my answer would be that's not a, that's not a problem but it's, it's worth another look maybe. Mm -hmm. Anything from Linda? Nothing to add on that one. Okay, well here's the next one. Um, you mentioned minimization methods in the context of COVID-19. In this situation, there is limited knowledge of potential prognosis factors. For example, age obviously seems to be one, as well as comorbidities like diabetes. Could you share what other factors should be considered in this case of a minimization? Well, Actually, I have to be um, very transparent here. This particular study, um, because it's it's a very um, new study, they're, they're just trying to learn about it. It will be set up using a randomization list and not minimization. Um, and the only factor is going to be used. In fact, it's, in the very beginning, it's not even stratified by site because we have very few patients to be looked at at each time. So minimization is a very good method to use, but it's not always the method to use in all situations. Mm -hmm. And and again, I think for COVID-19, you know, I've been involved in the design of some trials. To be honest, people really don't really know yet what the prognostic factors are. And so I think the question is more, you know, let's get this 
try and start it now rather than wait to have better knowledge of the prognostic factors and in the in the few cases that I've been involved in I think other than sight uh, there was no inclusion of other prognostic factors um, I think we probably need to have more knowledge of the disease itself before that becomes evident exactly okay yeah they're giving you some tough ones <laughs> here's the next one yeah, good questions good questions yeah they're very engaged okay can you comment on doing randomization tests within the context of the minimization algorithm obviously one cannot do a simple per permutation test since not all possible treatments assignments have the same probability uh, what are your thoughts on that well i mean the, again as i said it's a pure uh, computer based uh, approach so we don't use a sort of um, a theoretical uh, you know permutational distribution we just simulate trials and re-randomize patients using the same algorithm as the one that was used in the actual trial and so it um, does not require any kind of assumptions on the permutational distributions it's just uh, based on the data themselves and resampling from the data and and since there is um some chance first of all the very first patient is flipping a coin you know if it's it's two treatments you flip a coin to see which treatment they'll get and then of course based on that the second treatment will be given and there there's also always that chance and so that's why in this re-randomization we get a lot of different combinations of treatments because each time you're throwing a dice whether it's a you know a biased dice of 80 20 or the 50 50 at the very beginning yeah, yeah. And that's a good reason to use a, a stochastic minimization algorithm rather than the deterministic, because if you were to do deterministic minimization, you might end up with a, a permutation space that have very few points, actually, because if you deterministically allocate treatments, you know, m many of the, ran of the allocations will be deterministic. And therefore, if you do the re-randomization, uh, they won't change uh, mm -hmm. as much as you would like them to change over the, the, the you know, the whole permutation space. Okay. All right. Uh, we still have a lot of questions here, but I'm going to try to squeeze in one more. Uh, and this one here is, is the re-randomization test the same as a permutation test? Um, you made it sound like it was, but maybe you can point out there's a, the differences, is what this audience mm -hmm. member is asking. Yes, I think the two, uh, what's a bit confusing is that the two terms are used, you know, almost interchangeably. Um, uh, this, I would call this more a re-randomization test because that's exactly what it is. You know, you take the actual data and you just shuffle the treatments by re-randomizing the patients. So I think re-randomization in this context is a more specific term. Permutation test is a more generic term to, you know, to allude to the fact that we permute the treatment allocations. But I think re-randomization is more specific in this case. Okay. Linda, anything to comment on that? Nothing to add. Okay. I'm going to squeeze in this one last one. I've never seen so many questions coming through, so let's see if we squeeze <laughs> this one in. Can the re-randomization be the sensitivity analysis rather than the primary analysis method? Hmm. That's a question for the agencies. I mean, I would make it the <laughs> primary personally because, as I said, this is really the analyze as you randomize principle. So I wouldn't have any, you know, problem with making the re-randomization test the primary analysis method. But like I said, in real cases, um, the difference between the asymptotic test and the re-randomization test is, to be honest, is, is really trivial. So it, it doesn't really make a difference. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. There was so many questions, but we have reached the end of the question and answer portion of the webinar. And I'm sorry if we couldn't attend to your questions, but the team at International Drug Development Institute, IDDI, may follow up with you after this presentation. If you have any further questions, direct them to the email address that's on your screen, and that's Dominique Grizzard. Uh, at uh, dominic.grizzard at iddi.com or you can call at 3210-614444. So once again, I'd just like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email with Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that.
Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Mark Boyce, Chief Scientific Officer, and Linda Danielson, Chief Operating Officer, both from International Drug Development Institute, IDDI, for that very insightful presentation. Linda and Mark, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Sonia. You. We hope we I hope everyone found this webinar very informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at XTalks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, take care and bye for now.